And the next item of business is a consideration of business motion 12046 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a variation and a suspension to standing orders to allow a debate on a sta Scottish statutory instrument this afternoon. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press the request to speak button now. And as no member has, I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 12046. Moved. Many thanks. And as no member has asked to speak against the motion, therefore I'll now put the question to the Chamber. And the question is that motion number 12046, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. And we now move to the next item of business, which is topical questions. Question one, Mike McKenzie. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on efforts to restore power supplies affected by severe weather. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President Officer, the weekend saw Scotland endure some of the worst weather for many years with four exceptional weather events on four consecutive days. Frontline workforce in the power supply companies uh, managed to battle through very difficult conditions, have stayed safe and restored customer supplies into the bargain. I would like to express on behalf of the Scottish Government our sincere thanks to those frontline workers and to those from other distribution network operators who provided additional resources and also to the contracting community who travelled long distances and endured long and hard working conditions and hours to assist in the restoration effort. The total number of homes affected by the weather was 111,000 on the 8th of January. A total of 918 homes were without power for over 48 hours, but I am pleased to say that the last few customers who were off electricity supply following the weekend storms have now been reconnected. Many thanks. Mike McKenzie. Can the Secretary tell us what multi-agency support was provided for households affected by power outages over a sustained period of time? Mr. Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, over the course of the weekend, um, I convened a number of meetings of the Government's resilience operation it's supported uh, by um, Mr Mackay, the Transport Minister, and Dr Macleod, the Minister for uh, the Environment, um, and worked with a variety of agencies, um, the Met Office, the uh, transport uh, companies, uh, First Scott Rail um, and uh, Network Rail, the um, power utility companies, uh, Scottish and Southern Energy and Scottish Power, um, the uh, work of SEPA, uh, uh, the Martin Coast Guard Agency, uh, Transport Scotland and a variety of other organisations, including our local resilience networks. And one of the things which I think we have we concentrated on most directly, given the fact that there were a number of customers who were off supply for a significant period of time, was that there was integrated welfare support available to members of the public who were off supply. And I would compliment the power companies and local authorities and various other bodies at local level for working constructively together. Indeed, on one occasion, um, facilities were made available on one of the Caledonian McBrain vessels that was berthed in Harris to provide support uh, to individuals who were without power in the island of Harris, which I think is uh, just some of the imagination that's gone into trying to support people in a very difficult set of circumstances. Thank you. Mike McKenzie. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that. Answer. And I wonder, I know, I know that he's thanked all involved, but I wonder if he would extend a particular thanks to the, the crews, the men that are up climbing those poles, and the engineers who work tirelessly in very difficult weather conditions to, respore, to restore power to the homes affected throughout Scotland in, as I say, very difficult conditions. Come the Secretary. Uh, Officer, I have written today to the Chief Executive of Scottish Power and Scottish and Southern Energy to ask them to convey to their staff, as I have done publicly, the enormous debt of gratitude we have to individuals who were enduring uh, truly shocking conditions in trying to restore power supplies. Uh, a number of members of the public who lost power supply I have seen on the media 
um, expressing their appreciation, having lived through the conditions that they were living through over the last few days, at the uh, determination of the power supply workers to restore supply. So um, I am very happy to put that comment on the record on behalf of the Scottish Government and have asked the power companies to convey our thanks directly to the staff that have been involved. Many thanks. Uh, Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you. I am sure all members in the Chamber would want to associate themselves with the tributes paid to the engineers and others who worked so hard to help those in need. Uh, but can I ask the, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, in view of the uh, increasing instances of extreme weather that we are now seeing, does he think it is time for a review of transmission infrastructure more generally to ensure it has the appropriate resilience to deal with such events? These questions are um, consistently assessed by the distribution companies and obviously lessons learnt from the um, experiences that we have. Uh, I think when, when you look at the scale of the disruption that was experienced and look at the recovery operation, um, I think there are two conclusions that can be drawn from that. One is that the scale of the incidents with which uh, we have been wrestling have been um, exceptional in terms of the intensity of the uh, wind strength and wind impact that has been, um, th 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 that's been experienced and the damage that's been caused. And secondly, that uh, in terms of resilience, the power companies are able to mobilise very significant resources to address these issues. And one of the points that struck me in preparing for this incident, because our discussions, we were involved in discussions with the power companies long before any of the damage started being taken, was the degree to which the power companies were following the forecast on the Met Office, putting resources in place in different parts of the country where they didn't have resource to make sure they were ready for the damage when it came. Um, and I think that um, is a, a, an example of the significant approach taken to dealing with resilience by the power companies. Many thanks. Uh, question two, David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taken to resolve transport disruption caused by recent storms. Minister Derek Mackay. Transport Scotland and partner organisations activated the multi-agency response team on Thursday evening to oversee the direction of resources on the Trunk Road network. As you have just heard, both myself and the Deputy First Minister chaired regular resilience meetings to maintain contact with our key partners throughout the period of disruption and recovery. First ScotRail and Network Rail plan to operate a curtailed timetable on Friday and widely publicise the likelihood of disruption in advance. However, the storm had a greater impact on services than anticipated and a suspension of all rail services was deemed necessary. During the recovery, Network Rail had some 400 staff available to repair overhead cables and remove obstacles from rail lines, including over 500 trees. The scale of the storms did bring travel's disruption with the cancellation of ferries and the temporary closure of some road bridges due to the high winds. With fallen trees and debris on the road and rail lines, Right across the country, I would also like to thank all frontline staff who helped with the clearance efforts, sometimes during very difficult conditions at all hours of the day and night. And finally, can I inform the members uh, that similar arrangements are in place for the various Met Office amber and yellow warnings for snow across much of Scotland, valid from this afternoon. David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the recent storms were unusual in that they were a one in ten year event. Will the Minister review whether the roads network has sufficient variable message signs covering hotspot areas, particularly in more rural and remote areas? And is the Minister confident that the messages conveyed are accurate and current? Could better use be made of virtual snow gates, which are flashing signs which warn that the road ahead is adversely affected by snow, wind uh, or rain, and that drivers should turn round at this location? Minister. I think we've made considerable progress over the last number of years in our resilience and our response efforts and been able to deploy staff and teams uh, where they're uh, required and advanced planning uh, is very important. In terms of the use of EMS, the variable, uh, variable message signage, of course I'll look again at how we uh, use that to give accurate, up-to-date information. Uh, in addition to the other sources of information that we have, be that radio, websites, uh, at Twitter and other sources of information. But of course for the driver they will be uh, seeing the, the live real-time uh, signage and we will 
uh, undertake to ensure it is as helpful as it possibly can be uh, during these kind of incidents. I should add, though, some of our signage uh, was affected in terms of power outages and so on, and we can't avoid that, but that is where some of the uh, mobile units may be even more helpful. But, of course, we will take every action possible to get information to uh, drivers and travellers so that uh, people can travel as safely as is possible. David Stewart. Thank you, sir. Uh, will the Minister review future design and new road construction, such as the duelling of the A9? Does the Minister feel there is a need to have greater provision to cope with flooding, uh, particularly uh, to build super-large storm drains, such as are developed across the United States? Minister. Well, certainly we want the new roads construction to be of the highest standard, and we will design it to the conditions that are prevailing in Scotland. I am happy to look at uh, further evidence, but bearing in mind this was a particular incident of uh, high winds and then rain, and then back to high winds and now snow and ice in terms of the disruption we faced over the last few days. But of course, any engineering solutions we can find to cope with the emerging Scottish weather we will uh, explore. Thank you so much. Sandra White. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the, the Minister will be aware of the recent convoy transporting nuclear weapons on the M8 and M74 on Sunday, 11th of January. Uh, terrible weather conditions. Uh, can I ask, uh, therefore, what advice, if any, uh, the Scottish Government or the Minister was given in regards to the safety of the population of Greater Glasgow, where this transportation took place, and the advent of the disruption in the severe weather conditions? Minister. Similar to warnings uh, across the country, there were uh, various uh, information out there in terms of checking sources of information, particularly in relation to driving. There was a message, clear message to drive with uh, caution and drive to the conditions. And in terms of some of the uh, bridge infrastructure, there were some restrictions on the bridges to, for example, high-sided vehicles. Many thanks. Question three, Mike Russell. To, may I ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to assist dairy farmers contracted to First Milk, who have been notified over the weekend of a further reduction in price and the postponement of payments due? Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead. Understandably, many farmers will be disappointed and indeed anxious following the recent announcement by First Milk. I spoke to the company's chairman, Sir Jim Pace, last week, who confirmed that it had taken a decision to protect its long-term viability against the backdrop of continued uncertainty and volatility in the global dairy sector. I am now conducting a number of uh, meetings in the coming days, including a meeting with the NFUS and other industry representatives tomorrow to hear about the impact at first hand, and I will get a further update from First Milk and I hopefully meet them next week. The Government will continue to make every effort to support farmers in difficult times and are taking forward a number of work streams through a recent dairy review known as Ambition 2025, in particular to encourage farmers to contact the recently launched Dairy Hub, which is a free advice and support service on a range of issues. Equally, we are also looking for support from our retailers in Scotland and throughout these islands to make sure they are supporting local producers and paying a fair price for their dairy produce. Mike Russell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for that answer and to the concern that the Cabinet Secretary has shown. He'll be aware that there are 51 dairy farmers in Argyll and Butte who are members and suppliers to First Milk and who feel badly let down by the company, which from the 1st of February will be paying 18 pence a litre. That's 12 and a half pence a litre less than it was being paid on the 1st of June. It's five and a half pence less than the nearest payment from other suppliers, and it's at least 7% p less than the actual lowest cost of production. In addition, the capital retention and the delayed payment schedule from First Milk is causing insecurity worry and hardship, and in Kintyre that is added to by the question marks over the creamery and the lack of uptake by First Milk of the investment offered. Will the Cabinet Secretary agree to meet a delegation of dairy farmers from Kintyre and Butte uh, to hear about these issues firsthand and the particular hardships that members of First Milk have? And secondly, will he intervene urgently with the banks to ask them not to take any precipitate action regarding these matters, particularly with those member suppliers to First Milk, until this matter is resolved. The Secretary. 
Michael Russell, of course, quite rightly highlights the fragility of many of the businesses in his own constituency and indeed in terms of uh, this current issue that's replicated in other island and rural communities in Scotland given the importance our dairy farming sector plays in those particular communities. So I'd be happy to meet Michael Russell uh, and a delegation from his constituency in the very near future and no doubt we can arrange that shortly. And in terms of contacting the banks, I think Michael Russell again makes a very, very good point. I do often meet the banks to discuss some of the issues facing our rural industries and I'd be happy to arrange a meeting with the banks again in the very, very near future to follow the points made by Michael Russell. Many thanks. Alex Ferguson. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Mike Officer. Russell, I, I'm sorry, I should have called Mike Russell again. Forgive me. Mike. Officer, I thought it was something I'd said. Um, the key issue that the First Milk has, has made much of is the downgrading of world demand for milk. But there is another very important issue, which I know the Cabinet Secretary is aware of because of his passionate advocacy of Scottish food, and that is the extraordinarily low price of milk within supermarkets. When supermarkets are selling milk at less than the cost of water, then something is wrong. And the message needs to go from this chamber, from the minister who has greatly supported Scottish food, to supermarkets and to the public, that the price of milk has to be realistic in order to support a dairy industry in Scotland. Could he say what actions he might take, and the government might take in their food policy, to make sure that there is a realism about the price of milk, which it cannot be produced for less than a pint of mineral water? Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> Well, again, it's certainly the case that there are a range of factors affecting the price of milk at the moment. There's the decline in the demand from China, for instance. There's a Russian food import ban, which means there's more dairy produce within Europe that has to be sold. And that increases the supply of dairy produce within Europe, and therefore the price comes down. And, of course, there is the fact that Michael Russell has quite rightly highlighted that milk has been devalued. If we think of the amount of effort that's put into producing liquid milk, which we all buy as consumers and require to live our daily lives, and the fact that that's now selling at four pints for 89 pence in some of our key supermarkets, it's such a pity to see such a good product being devalued. It does also highlight that we have to add value to the product in Scotland to ensure we have better security in the future. But in the meantime, I will be taking the message suggested by Michael Russell to our retailers that they have to ensure they do not devalue this product and they pay a decent price for it to their suppliers. Alex Ferguson, now, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I have great sympathy with Mike Russell's um, uh, constituents when it comes to the fragility of this situation, but I can assure the Chamber that that fragility is not just confined to Argyll and Butte. There's uh, the whole of the southwest of Scotland is affected. I think it's worth noting that if the worst happened and first milk was to collapse, there would be a further 800 million litres of milk looking for a home across the UK. And the principal reason for that, as I think has already been mentioned, the principal reason for the disastrous fall in the price of milk is the massive surplus of liquid milk on the world markets at the moment. Um, that is out with any individual dairy farmer's control. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what steps his government has taken, is taking and will hopefully continue to take to encourage investment in further milk processing facilities that would reduce the surplus of liquid milk on the world markets? Cabinet Secretary. Well, despite the very serious challenges we're discussing in the Chamber today, the longer-term outlook for dairy produce in the world is actually quite optimistic and demand is expected to rise dramatically, which should open up opportunities for Scottish uh, dairy producers if we can add value to liquid milk and capture those niche markets around the world. Uh, just as we have done with beef, lamb and whiskey and other products, we should be doing the same with dairy produce. And that was the, the core purpose of the dairy review that we did carry out. And now the plan has been put into practice and we have a dairy growth board and we have the dairy hub being set up to give advice to dairy farmers. So that's certainly on our agenda and I very much recognise the concerns expressed by Alec Ferguson given, of course, the majority of dairy farmers in Scotland are based in south-west Scotland and we are paying close attention to what's happening with First Milk and the fortunes of his constituents. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, looking uh, to the longer term and building on what the Cabinet Secretary has already said um, this afternoon in support of dairy farmers, can the Cabinet Secretary reassure the Chamber about the initiatives Scottish Government and Food and Drink Scotland are taking to help support niche markets for dairy products such as Lanarkshire Blue and Loch Arthur cheeses, which are made in my region, and to help the development of new products for the home and export markets? And would he consider, if he's not doing so already, featuring Scottish dairy prod products and producers in 2015 Year of Food and Drink for Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> 
As I said, there are many opportunities for increasing dairy exports to around the world. And indeed, I remember leading a food and drink mission to Dubai and also to other uh, markets. And subsequent to some of those missions, there have been new markets opened up for cheese exports from Scotland. So that's certainly something we are targeting. But as, as highlighted by this particular issue we're speaking about today, there's got to be a lot more of that in the foreseeable future. And Claudia Beamish is quite right. She mentioned some fine cheeses, but we do have a lot of fantastic dairy products in Scotland and 2015 is the year of food and drink so it gives us an ideal platform for making sure we get the message across to the Scottish public and the, the wider markets beyond Scotland that we should be exporting to those markets and allowing people to enjoy our fantastic produce. Finally and briefly Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will remember that I discussed the issue of milk prices and particularly impact on farmers in my Stirling constituency before the, the Christmas recess. I wonder for the longer term if you could tell us more about what we might be able to do to support the processing industry for milk in Scotland, given that its crucial role for the future, and particularly take lessons from what's happened in Denmark and in Ireland about how they've managed to grow their processing industries, particularly given that this, that this particular year is the year of food and drink. Cabinet Secretary. Well, we're always uh, hopeful of supporting uh, as much vertical integration in the supply chain in the dairy sector as possible to capture the value in Scotland of our dairy produce and also to share the benefits of that across primary production and processing uh, as well. But in terms of the relationship between the different parts of the supply chain, of course, recently we saw the setting up of the Grocery Code Adjudicator by the UK Government after many years of lobbying by many parties in this chamber. And of course, I think there may be a case for the adjudicator to shine more of a light on the contracts across the supply chain. Yes, between the primary producer and the processors, but also the processors and the retailers. And we have to make sure we continue to shine that light on that supply chain to ensure that everyone's got a fair share of every pound spent on dairy produce. Many thanks. And that concludes topical questions. And we now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12034 in the name of Keith Brown on protecting...